Well, welcome to, uh, thank you for joining us for our launch event for our new initiative on the economics of digital services. Uh, my name is Christopher Yu. I am a professor uh, here at the University of Pennsylvania of Law, Computer Science and Communication. And I'm joined with my, by my colleague Rikesh Bora. We are the, the co-conveners, the co-leads on what we think is a very exciting project uh, uh, that we think is very both timely and important and a wonderful research area for academics uh, to pursue. Uh, before I go into the substance of the program, I should note for those of you who are participating that uh, we are recording the session and we'll make it available uh, afterwards uh, on the, uh, through the Penn website and through Penn channels, uh, just so everybody knows. And in addition, anyone who is gaining, uh, would like credit for continuing legal education, uh, there will be words that come up twice during the event as polls. Uh, for those of you who are not interested, you can simply X those out. Uh, for those of you who are interested, please make sure to write them down and include them in your CLE certification uh, to, uh, at the end to make sure you receive proper credit. Second, lastly, before I uh, go into this, we will be taking question and answers at the end. Uh, the speakers have agreed to do so. Um, we will activate the Q&A function. So if you have questions, please feel free to submit them there. Um, so in a sense, it's interesting when we began exploring this project and you will see the press release that came out announcing it, uh, it came out in September of last year, 2019. Uh, we knew that this was going to be an important area both for research and for public policy. Little did we know that the day before the event, uh, the Just US Justice Department would file a complaint against Google uh, in, in this exact space. Uh, that complaint is only the most recent of a series of events that has highlighted the importance of the economics of digital services. Uh, the House Judiciary Committee issued a report a couple weeks ago uh, that culminated a 16 month investigation famously punctuated by a hearing in July where the CEOs of four major companies all testified. This is on the heels of reports issued by the European Union, by the United Kingdom, by Australia and their, all their competition authorities, the Stigler Center in Chicago, and a number of high profile enforcement actions brought in the EU and other countries. What's striking though is despite all this interest in this area, uh, the, ec the economic foundations for understanding digital services still is radically underdeveloped in our opinion. Uh, we need a better understanding both theoretically and empirically of how these companies use data. A major part of uh, the uh, House report and other commentary is based on, on how the businesses are structured and whether they're self-preferencing. And that's a question of vertical integration. And we decided that the time was right for a new initiative to try to build the analytical foundation for, these, uh, for, this, uh, future, uh, for the future of digital services. And from doing, thanks to the generosity of the Knight Foundation, we have a new initiative to do that, uh, built around a number of, uh, of colleagues here at Penn. Uh, Rakesh Bora is one of three university professors who are involved to some extent in this project and involved in competition law at Penn. Uh, and, and I'll introduce him briefly as soon as I wrap this in just one moment. Uh, but uh, Rakesh is the co-principal investigator on this grant, but along with two other university professors that, who have joint appointments across departments uh, who are antitrust experts. Herb Hovenkamp, who is the, the author of the leading uh, antitrust treatise and regarded as the Dean of uh, Legal Scholars in Antitrust. Abid Nevo, who is uh, uh, jointly appointed between Wharton and Economics is the former uh, chief economist for the US Department of Antitrust Division. Other colleagues, Joe Harrington, Jonathan Click, all of us are deeply involved in competition law, competition policy and the economics underlying and uh, we think that this is a great, this is the right time and Penn is the right place to launch an initiative along these lines. So just to give you the outlines of the program, uh, we are, as I mentioned, issuing grants to uh, promote research in this area, uh, focusing on young scholars, but not exclusively so. Uh, there's, the deadline for that grant submission is October 30th. And the hope, the hope is this will culminate, the plan is to culminate this in a uh, conference in the summer uh, and for a broader audiences, including blog posts and other communications. Uh, we are currently advertising for a fellow to help staff this program. And in fact, we are actually exploring ways to augment it and to explore other areas beyond this well as well. So we are on something, we're launching something very exciting uh, here. We're delighted to be having you here join us on the launch. And without further ado, I will hand it off to uh, Rakesh Bora, the George A. Weiss and Lydia Bravo Weiss University Professor and the co-director of the Warren Center for Network and Data Sciences here at Penn. Uh, 
who is our, uh, our co-collaborator on this exciting event. Ricky. Uh, thank you very much, Christopher. And uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I have very little to add to what Christopher has had to say, except I look forward to the program. And why don't we get started, Chris? Well, thank you very much. And uh, we are honored to have three very distinguished speakers to join us who can offer their own perspectives on the importance of this work, but also in the case of one of them can will actually share with us the, the cutting edge of the, of the work that he's pursuing as well. Uh, the three speakers, the first is Maureen Olhausen, who is currently section chair for antitrust and competition law at Baker Botts and is the former acting chairman of the Federal Trade Commission, uh, which is one of the two agencies charged with enforcing competition, uh, the US competition laws. Uh, the second speaker will be Professor Leon Wagman, who's a professor of economics at the Stewart School of Business at the Illinois Institute of Technology. He is also currently serving as senior, in economic, senior economic and technology advisor at the Office of Policy and Planning at the Federal Trade Commission. Our third speaker was Howard Shalansky, who is a professor of law at the Georgetown University Law Center. He has among his many former distinguished government roles is the former director of the Bureau of Economics and Federal Trade Commission. Uh, Howard is willing to be joining us slightly later in the presentation, but he hopes he plans to join at 12.30. Something unavoidably came up, but he was uh, fortunately able to arrange his schedule to be able to join us. And after that, we will open the floor to questions. Without further ado, uh, Maureen. Well, thank you, Christopher, uh, and thank you to Penn uh, for hosting. I'm delighted to be here. Um, so my viewpoint is really shaped by the different um, positions that I've held. Christopher mentioned my current role at Baker Botts uh, and previously at the Federal Trade Commission. So I was the acting chair and I was also a commissioner for a little over six years. Uh, but even before that, when I was head of the po Office of Policy Planning at the Federal Trade Commission uh, and focused on a lot of you know, policy research and competition advocacy uh, and trying to create ideas uh, you know, for enforcement and you know, looking, looking for good cases, um, all of these experiences have really brought home to me the importance of having a strong economic foundation for the work uh, that enforcers and policymakers do. I think you know, one of the really important things to understand is um, just having that idea of like what, you know, what is likely to be the outcome of what, <laughs> of what you're doing, uh, which sometimes I think maybe gets lost in the, uh, the idea that you should be doing something, um, but you need to be careful about making sure that it's uh, you know, certainly going to make consumers and markets better off. So to kind of with that with that lens uh, uh, in mind, um, I provided comments. We talked. You mentioned the House Judiciary Committee um, proceeding on competition in tech markets and the new staff report that came out. And I actually testified in front of that committee as an antitrust expert last year and have filed um, comments with them at their at their request. And one of the things that I try to lay the foundation for is the idea that what we need at least for uh, sensible enforcement is to have three pillars. Um, and I would always say this uh, to my staff, there's a, basically there are three arrows <clears throat> and they all should be pointing in the same direction. And that is what are, is the law, uh, what are the facts, and then what are the economics. Um, because without having those three pillars, I, we can't be confident that one, we would bring a successful enforcement action or two, that it, even if we were successful, that it, that it was the right thing, uh, the right thing to do. So uh, as someone who's had to make a decision on, you know, go or no go on a lot of different uh, cases, having that strong economic background uh, to, uh, to rely upon is very, very useful. To, particularly when you get when you start getting into digital markets, they're, they're pretty complicated. They're often two-sided markets. Um, people often say, oh, well, antitrust and the consumer welfare standard no longer is relevant uh, because it only looks at price um, and you only measure dollars and cents, which really, really isn't true. But I think economics can help um, unpack some of that. So it was really interesting um, that I, I actually went to the oral argument for the Amex case 
uh, when it was before the Supreme Court. And they really had a lot of ba very basic questions about, well, is it a two-sided market if it is just a um, consumer paying you know, a store for a product? It's like, no, no, that's a one-sided market. <laughs> You're like, what's a two-sided market? And then, then kind of unpacking it from there. So, um, so really, you know, the idea of um, how complex some of these markets are, and they can be very, very efficient. Complexity isn't necessarily a bad thing but just how it requires, I think, a more sophisticated understanding. So some of the tools that I've seen uh, used very e effectively uh, in the economic arsenal for enforcement and for policy are not just predictions about what might happen, uh, but also um, looking back and figuring out were these actions, you know, did they, have good outcomes for consumers? Do they have bad outcomes for consumers, for markets, for competition? Can other things be changed? Uh, so when I was uh, at the commission, several of the things that we did that I thought were really useful involved um, retrospectives, where we looked back at you know, particular mergers. Did this have a, you know, the, the, um, the impact that we, we expected? Uh, we also did a very uh, careful look at merger remedies to see if the remedies were performing as they were supposed to, because ultimately you can win a case, but if you impose a remedy and it doesn't um, get the outcome that you were hoping, then that's kind of a, a more than a lost opportunity, kind of a wasted uh, waste, waste of resources. Um, and one of the other things about antitrust enforcement that, that I always thought about is um, it's not, even if we say today, well, traditional, antitrust law and antitrust enforcement can address many of the challenges that people are identifying in digital markets. That doesn't mean that our tools can't be improved. Uh, we always need to be looking to improve our, to our tools for detecting anti-competitive behavior, for predicting outcomes. And I think uh, economics is really, really the way to continue to improve those tools. And you, you can see as antitrust really um, had its uh, changes uh, over the years, that was really driven by economic understanding and, and, and improvements in, in, in economics. Um, but one of the other points that I want to make is that I think right now we are relying um, a lot on um, anic what I would call anic data. Uh, and I think the House Judiciary Staff Report indulged in that a bit. Uh, the idea that uh, a particular player may have been, you know, advantaged or disadvantaged over certain behavior, uh, and that that then somehow translates into an antitrust violation. I mean, it's, you know, it, it's a cliche at this point uh, to say, you know, antitrust law is supposed to protect competition, not individual competitors. Uh, but I think that uh, there has been a little bit of a, a focus on, well, if an, in, in, you know, a, an identifiable party was uh, you know, disadvantaged by certain business behavior, that that business behavior you know, by, a, by a large player, then, then that business behavior itself is, is anti-competitive. And I, I think that um, use of anic data uh, it is not going to uh, serve consumers and, and competition very well in the long run. I thought it was very interesting. So just on October 9th, uh, FTC Chairman Joe Simons gave a speech at the Fordham Conference where he talked about um, economic um, uh, research and um, the idea that you, know, you can have it, but it has to be reliable that it, it itself, just having economic research by on its own is not sufficient. You have to make sure that it is using the right yardsticks, that it's using the right tools, that it is measuring the right things and making the right comparisons. And he had some very interesting examples that he gave where he has concerns about um, some merger retrospectives that, that the FTC economists have criticized um, uh, for not uh, measuring, you know, a, a wide enough uh, array of industries or looking at like kind of some, you know, pre-HSR kind of be, you know, so now we have the HSR Act and companies can, uh, I mean, uh, agencies know about mergers before they happen, uh, but using very old data sets that don't capture the, the 
I wouldn't even call them new tools. It's from 1976, the, the HSR Act. Um, also, some of the research that is creating um, the idea of causation uh, rather than correlation. I think, you know, I'm not an economist, uh, but I think that we, we really need to be careful about conflating, conflating those two things. Um, and some of the things that Chairman Simons pointed out um, were actually economic studies that were cited in the House Judiciary Staff Report uh, without looking at the, um, uh, the studies uh, or the critiques of that and just kind of look, looking at those studies as conclusive when they're not conclusive. And one of the things that I, uh, one, one of my uh, sayings that, that um, maybe it's called Karl Popper who said it, that there's no such thing as settled science, right? If, it, <laughs> if it's settled, it's not science. Like we have to continue to refine and to test and to ensure that what we're you know, relying on is you know, it is actually telling us the things that the authors are, are telling us, are saying that it that it's telling us. Um, so, so those are some, I think, the really key areas these days where we need additional research, where it would be very useful for making not just enforcement decisions, but also policy decisions. Because when you look at that House Judiciary Staff Report, it has some uh, sweeping recommendations about changing um, presumptions and mergers, about uh, not allowing certain companies to uh, acquire, you know, uh, other other companies, to you know, having, you know, some uh, behaviors that may be well intended, but we need an economic foundation to understand whether they really have the outcomes that the um, you know, the people advocating these think, think they will. Like will stopping, um, you know, large players from being able to buy small players actually increase innovation? Will it increase startup formation? I think there's good economic uh, research out there that, that suggests that's not the case. Um, and I think we need to look, look at all of that to really get to, to the right outcomes. Um, so, so I'm d delighted that you have this project. I think it's uh, something that's very, uh, very valuable. It's very timely. Um, I think this debate about digital platforms and antitrust and should we change the standards and what's best for consumers and the consumer welfare standard could all very much benefit from uh, good economic research that takes a hard look at these issues, um, has reliable and you know, uh, conclusions uh, and doesn't just kind of look, look to the easy, the anic data kind of outcome. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. I look forward to the discussion um, and uh, to hearing from my fellow panelists. Well, thank you very much, Maureen. Uh, that, uh, I think you've set the stage brilliantly. And for one of those scholars who is actually uh, moving beyond the anic data and trying to fill in some of the the gaps that we have, uh, I hand over the floor to uh, Professor Leo Wadman. Thank you, Christopher and Ricky for organizing this uh, important initiative and for having me here. Uh, and thank you, Maureen, for, for the fantastic you know, uh, setup. Um, at the outset, let me just state that these uh, thoughts are my own. Uh, they're not of any organization or agency or of the FTC or any of its individual commissioners. I have uh, studied the economics of digital and information markets over the last 15 years or so. And while many of my projects have focused on digital privacy, lead generation, and informational costs or injuries as Maureen might, might like to, to phrase it and benefits, um, they also point out the value of information more broadly and the value of uh, the digital ecosystem uh, specifically. And lately I've begun to focus more on the latter more directly uh, by assessing, for instance, the consumer surplus generated uh, from some digital services. And I'll be happy to share some results today uh, for the first time. Uh, the digital ecosystem is complex, it's fast evolving, and both consumers and firms have been uh, beneficiaries of the, the economic value created. And today I want to briefly mention three lines of work I've done along with colleagues. And I think these works illustrate a few dimensions of the potential benefits, costs, and risks in those markets. And in general, my observation is that value creation and innovation are still happening at extraordinarily fast rates. And this raises the stakes for any intervention uh, due to the potential for unintended consequences. Take for instance, uh, a mandate of data interoperability or data sharing 
that may be imposed in a market that is not currently hindered by uh, severe data flow restriction. While firms can benefit from sharing data with each other on a voluntary basis, a market-driven basis, it can be another source of revenue, whether directly or indirectly, right? Uh, they may not do it uniformly, but uniformity does not necessarily imply efficiency. And mandating uniformity, for instance, as a duty to deal, can at times be inefficient and lead to unintended consequences. Take, for example, the impact of uh, duty to deal in terms of data sharing uh, on firms' incentives. Uh, the impact is largely unclear. New trade-offs may emerge as a result uh, as far as how to collect raw data and which data to store. If a firm is required to share, for example, clickstream data, with some proposals in the EU in that direction, for instance, then it also needs to save this data. It needs to save it for a certain period of time. It needs to share it with another party or parties. And aside from the potential effects this might have on privacy and data security, it might also shift firm resources from one activity to another. As another example of unintended consequences, consider that there's some talk of asymmetric regulation, uh, focusing on large incumbents in order not to raise entry costs uh, on smaller players. In other words, different sets of rules for different groups of firms. If the intent of intervention, at least in part, is to enhance, for example, privacy, then asymmetric regulation may distort incentives to adopt the state of the art privacy from the get go, right, by entrance from the ground up because they may not be subject to, to that regulation. Uh, and so it may expose some consumers who are early adopters of new products to added risks. And maybe those consumers will reconsider their decisions to adopt in the first place. And that could hurt entrance. So you see there's this trade-off and there is these potential unintended consequences that need to be thought about. Similarly, uh, uh, one thought for interoperability is standard formation. It may create more competition in one dimension. But the problem is that Technology is highly fluid, especially software, especially consumer facing software and standards may lag the pace of innovation. The digital ecosystem is dynamic and innovation dependent, whether in products or in business models. And I'll discuss some, some results, empirical results shortly that, that demonstrate that. Products change, consumer preferences change. And so any intervention, however small, needs to take into account the risk of unintended consequences. So to illustrate this point, in a paper published in the Rand Journal of Economics, a colleague and I study the opt-out provision of the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act, or GLB. Uh, this, this act governs data in financial markets. And we're comparing the opt-out provision to stricter opt-in provision enacted by some local counties in California. The GLB Act requires financial institutions to notify consumers about how their personal information is collected and used. In order to sh share or sell uh, consumer data to non-affiliated third parties, firms must first give consumers a chance to opt out. That is to request that their data is not shared. And under such an opt out mechanism, if consumers care, they can act. And we can of course have a discussion about how easy it should be to act, to opt out. And that's another topic that I've actually studied. Now in a natural experiment back in, all the way back in 2002, three out of five counties in the San Francisco metropolitan statistical area enacted local ordinances that adopted an opt in approach. And under this different approach, in order to share or sell consumer data, firms would require a written waiver from consumers. So you can notice that the difference is kind of subtle. It's just the default, whether it's opt out or opt in. And we show in that paper that the opt in provision led to dramatic consequences. It led to less efficient matching between borrowers and loans, higher mortgage rates and defaults, as well as potential foreclosures down the road. In other words, due to tightening data flows under this opt in provision, market outcomes worsened for consumers. So a small change in the default can have significant implications that may be unintended. Another interpretation of this finding is that firms can voluntarily facilitate data sharing, so it may not need to be mandated. Now this perspective and findings are also reinforced by a number of more recent studies on aspects of the EU 2009 privacy directive and more recently the European Union's general data protection regulation or GDPR, including my own recent studies on GDPR. So just to give you a sense of this, in one recent study of GDPR, now forthcoming in the journal Marketing Science, my co-authors and I showed that the effects GDPR has had in terms of depressing investment in European technology ventures are quite considerable to the tune of 26% reduction in the number of venture financing deals uh, after GDPR rolled out. 
Now, uh, the effects are more magnified for younger ventures, for consumer facing ventures. And even though those types of firms carry most of the, the impact, other firms, including business to business ventures, uh, were negatively affected as well. Now, we further show in subsequent projects that foreign investors are deterred from investing in EU ventures as a result of GDPR almost twice as much as domestic EU investors. In addition, we found that there is a 21% reduction in the number of first round deals. So first round deals represent the first time ventures raise financing uh, as recorded in, in our data sets from Refinitiv and Crunchbase. This means that there could be up to a fifth a fifth of EU ventures that after GDPR, if they needed this funding to get off the ground and couldn't get it anywhere else, may have failed to materialize. And even if those ventures could find funding elsewhere, think of the potential frictions uh, added to the innovation and entry process. Think what this means in an overall sense. Ventures that could have come to fruition may have not, or may have come to fruition outside the EU. And investor networks that could have been leveraged and access to provide networking, mentoring, and international marketing and revenue channels uh, to those EU ventures may have not been accessed. Economic value that could have been generated in the EU may have moved elsewhere or simply failed to be. Now the EU is now proposing various fixes to GDPR, but those early damages can prove permanent, particularly if those ventures that could have become key players in the EU digital ecosystem failed to materialize as a result of short run distortions. Now, some of the cures being proposed by the EU include asymmetric data regulation and asymmetric regulations for data sharing. But as I mentioned before, they, those types of cures can include their own unintended consequences. So finally, I want to tie uh, my discussion together with uh, several points about interdependency in the digital ecosystem and economic value and surplus uh, as part of a new study I'm working on. Now, uh, there are some studies such as those by a team at MIT that use surveys and experiments to assert that there are a large number or considerable amount of consumer surplus derived from digital services. And uh, many of these services nowadays take place on smartphones and other uh, mobile devices. In a simplified sense, the smartphone digital ecosystem comprises many layers. Several of those layers are as follows. Platforms release new hardware and operating systems accompanied by software development kits, also known as SDKs. Those SDKs enable developers to take advantage of the hardware and software features that are newly released. Developers come up with innovative ideas, innovative ideas for apps, for example. And then they may seek angel and venture capital funding for those ideas in order to bring them to the market. And if they are successful, then those ideas can come to the market in the form of new apps that are offered to consumers. So you can see how this is a multi-layered uh, process of, of potential innovation. Now, despite the theoretical understanding of platform markets in the academic literature, as, as Christopher mentioned earlier, and the well-established uh, practice of utilizing SDKs in the app ecosystem, how much economic value or consumer surplus is, is being generated by app ecosystems, at least empirically, has been elusive, except through potentially surveys and experiments. So using an expansive and detailed data set of iOS and Android app market activities from app intelligence services, Think uh, App Annie, Aptopia, or uh, Sensor Tower as, as examples. Along with my colleagues, I'm happy to share some, some early results. And these results identify strong links between these layers and specifically between new technology releases in the form of SDKs and consumer surplus. So our data comprises approximately 3,000 SDKs and millions of apps. And one implication of SDK adoption, just so, so we have that in mind, is that there can be more apps leveraging new technologies and new software offerings, right? And so SDK adoption uh, can increase the number of apps that are offered and can increase the quality of apps that are offered. It can also decrease the time it takes to develop apps. So it can bring more firms to the market, uh, releasing new products. Now our preliminary findings indicate billions of dollars annually in consumer surplus generated as of June, 2020 from average ranked apps alone with much of it having been made possible through these regular rounds of technology releases, these major releases of operating systems and new, new hardware. Now, to be clear, our analysis is of consumer surplus generated directly from apps as a software offering and not from apps as facilitators or intermediaries for external sales or other billings or other external transactions. So think 
as an example of the consumer surplus you derive from downloading a game on your phone and playing it. Okay, this is an example of the type of surplus we're estimating. And to, to estimate this, we, we have data on daily active users, monthly active users, um, number of downloads, uh, amount of uh, in-app purchases, even uh, estimated amounts for, for revenue from ads shown in, in the app. Now our analysis shows that over the history of smartphone availability, due to major new technology releases, as, uh, as we measure statistically as, as a one standard deviation change or a shock um, you know, in the number of, of SDKs available, the number of new apps created as a result of these new technologies controlling for other factors rises by a significant amount of more than 40% and sometimes up, upward of 100% over a period of two to three years from the release date, from the shock date of the new technologies. Now, in addition, as a result of these new technologies, more consumers adopt smartphones and combined, these results imply that new technology releases lead to both intensive margin increases in consumer surplus, meaning there's higher quality apps and extensive margin increases, both due to new apps being introduced and due to new smartphone adopters choosing to adopt smartphones, enabling them to access apps in the, in the first place. Now, the, the increases again are to the tune of billions of dollars over time. And uh, we're also able to show that these releases in SDKs and hardware also lead to a rise in, in venture capital and angel financing of, of new entrants. Okay, so we're basically able to tie this ecosystem together. Uh, back to my original point uh, about the, how, how quickly evolving these markets are, the, the data actually show, uh, or it helps illustrate just how dynamic these markets tend to be and how you know, one shock to the system can result in all these new uh, activities and, and dynamics uh, being introduced. So thank you very much. Uh, I'll yield back to, to Christopher. Well, thank you, Leon, for uh, really giving us a solid foundation and an excellent example of the kinds of empirical research that are necessary for us to really understand what's going on and to move beyond what Maureen so called we call the anic data. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm pleased to recognize Howard Chelansky, who has been able to join us. Uh, delighted to have you as part of this. As I mentioned before, he's had a number of distinguished positions in the government and without, uh, and is now a distinguished law professor at Georgetown University also. So, uh, and as uh, uniquely qualified because he is both a JD lawyer and a PhD in economics under the supervision of Oliver, uh, Nobel laureate Oliver Williamson. So without further ado, Howard. Great, thanks. Thanks very much, Christopher. And my, my apologies for having had to join uh, join late, but I, I really am very glad to be part of this uh, kickoff session and to talk about uh, a couple of areas of research that I think are, are, are really vital as we think about uh, both areas of aspects of how the digital economy works, but also how the, the digital economy will be governed. And um, I think some of what uh, I will say in the second part of my remarks relates to the very interesting presentation that we just heard from uh, Liad. Um, but let me start with, uh, uh, let me actually start with the governance side. I think right now it's, it's you know, unquestionable that there's a lot of concern about the governance of the digital economy. And I think that the concerns are really of, of two, two sides of a coin. On one hand, there is concern about how we deal with the possibility that monopoly or at least market size and uh, market share and market power could be durable in some aspects of the digital economy. And so there are a lot of proposals, most recently in the House Judiciary Committee report, uh, but also from a lot of thoughtful commentators around the world about how we need to have greater competition enforcement in the digital economy to ensure that durable monopolies uh, neither arise nor perpetuate themselves um, uh, in an anti-competitive way. Closely related to that is the question of how in a world where we have a lot of large platforms or several large platforms, we continue to incentivize uh, market entry, development and startups. Now, listening to what we just heard from Liad and listening, you know, and looking at a lot of the data, um, there is, of course, a lot of entrepreneurial activity, a lot of startup activity. Um, but the question is, how do we continue to incentivize that in the areas that will be most valuable to consumers and to society? And, and is there a concern 
that having certain areas of the digital economy be occupied by certain large players um, could lead, could, could perhaps not deter entry and innovation, but deter entry and innovation of certain kinds. And I want to address both of these issues and the kinds of research that might help us get a better understanding uh, of how to answer those questions. Starting first with governance. The model in the United States, and I think you know, in several other places in the world, uh, has been a model of uh, letting our competition enforcement regime uh, evolve by common law adjudication and the evolution of the common law. And so we see over the course of decades, um, different views and, and, and sort of, uh, uh, I, I would say risk profiles for antitrust enforcement emerging. And so for the first half of the 20th century, um, we saw the, you know, a continued concern, not just with the competitive process and with, with outcomes for consumers, but with competitors and preserving market access for competitors. Um, you know, with perhaps the high water mark of that being uh, the, the famous 1940s Alcoa case, where the Supreme Court recognized that the activity that Alcoa was undertaking in expanding its capacity in advance of demand as being, quote, honestly industrial, and in fact, being efficient, being a good thing for consumers and for buyers of aluminum ingot, because supply shocks would be avoided by this early advance investment. Yet on the other hand, the court found, entry by new competitors and the viability of new ingot uh, producers um, would, be, would be harmed by Alcoa's uh, advance entry and its movement down the cost curve. Uh, therefore, there was a violation of Section 2 of the Sherman Act. Over the next 50 years, we saw a shift away from that focus on the uh, status and uh, success of competitive entry to a focus on outcomes for consumers and what's called the consumer welfare standard, you know, in, in current antitrust um, uh, uh, parlance, where what we're really focused on is price and output for consumers. And if what you are doing is something that is a good outcome for consumers, um, in, in the words of, of Judge Kaufman in the 1970s Berkey photo case, we don't want to take any enforcement action that could deter that good outcome. So very much uh, a, a shift uh, towards um, recognizing that there can be benefits in activity that might perpetuate size, might perpetuate uh, the, con you know, the continued um, uh, 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 presence of, of the largest firm in the industry and make life difficult for entrants. But we didn't care about making life difficult for entrants if outcomes were good or the activity was at least plausibly good for consumers. The concern that I think has, that has arisen is that this common law process of evolution, uh, uh, common law evolution uh, towards balancing, say, the value of competitive entry in the competitive process and valuing competitive outcomes for consumers shifts too slowly and might not recognize uh, changes in particular kinds of markets fast enough. So there have been many proposals for reforming the antitrust laws better to deal with the digital economy, which because of network effects, because of you know, switching costs, because of information costs, may lead consumers to adhere to different platforms, which then may gain some kind of, of long-term presence in the market, not just because of network effects, but because of machine learning through data, access to more data. So the question is, do we need uh, better uh, antitrust enforcement tools? And do we need other governance tools? So two areas of research, I think, fall out of this question. The first is whether um, sort of adjudicative antitrust is the best way to actually get at some of the questions that large digital platforms uh, uh, pose for the economy. And this has led many people, myself included, in an article that I have forthcoming in the Penn Law Review with an economist from Northwestern, uh, uh, Bill Rogerson, whether we can borrow from certain models of access and interoperability uh, regulation that have been effectively put in place in the telecom arena, what we call lightweight 
uh, competition enhancing regulation, whether that's a better governance structure than ex post um, uh, adjudication as to particular access and interoperability decisions that a major platform uh, might make. Uh, recently, others have, have written about this as well. FTC Commissioner Rohit Chopra, uh, Michael Cadis, and Fiona Scott Morton have a recent paper that even has some draft le legislation. Tim Wu has written about this. And I think that um, the, the, the really important thing we need to do to get beyond sort of general proposals and ideas and, and, and broad recommendations here is to understand exactly what kinds of interoperability and interconnection are needed to make competitive entry sustained and viable um, uh, in connection with digital platforms. And so what I would want to see is how much regulation can be put in place that allows interconnection, interoperability, and access to incumbent platforms that would not be dependent on setting a price for such access? How much could effectively be self-executing? Something like bill and keep interconnection in the telephone area. We never worry about whether AT&T and Verizon will exchange telephone calls. They just do. And there's not an, you know, much need for price oversight or anything there. When we think about access to APIs or access to platforms and the information that are exchanged through those uh, APIs, the question is, is there a sufficiently rich environment of, uh, of information, of tools, of access that could be provided in a non-price area such that the fact of interconnection is all that needs to be observed and enforced and the oversight and terms of interconnection don't need to be regulated. To the extent that that is true, these kinds of access interconnection and interoperability remedies may be a win-win. They may be something that do not fall into a lot of the historic traps that um, industry regulation can sometimes create, more heavy-handed regulation. And they may avoid some of the need for constant case-by-case -case adjudication under uh, doctrine that evolves only slowly um, uh, to resolve certain problems and to preserve a competitive uh, environment. So I'd want to see more research, um, and I think technologists are going to be particularly important here, about whether there are forms of access interconnection and interoperability that don't depend on terms of access, but simply uh, objective observable facts of access. And what are those facts that we would want to observe? What is the kind of data, the kind of access? Uh, what kinds of metrics could we look at to make these effectively self-executing and, and, and easily monitorable? I think that's the next step in that, regula in that regulation debate. The next area that I would want to, to look at is, is, is not directly related, but I think relates to some of the points that Liad was making. I think that there are proposals out there that would greatly limit the ability of the large digital platforms to make acquisitions going forward. Um, I think if one looks at the data, uh, how many acquisitions are actually made, uh, what, you know, how, much, how many startups are actually launching, uh, the case for that kind of acquisition ban is, is, to put it mildly, questionable. On the other hand, I, I do think it is worth asking um, whether or not uh, uh, there should be um, uh, there should be concerns about acquisitions by large incumbents, and one of the current concerns would, would would be this: if I'm going to launch a startup and if I'm going to in innovate, I'm going to steer clear of certain areas in which the incumbents operate. You know, dead zones, and and Hal Varian has some compelling data and presentations that show that these dead zones don't exist, but. I do think we want to be sure that entry and innovation occurs across all areas of the digital economy and isn't sort of biased towards just being inputs or just being complements to the large digital platforms. So I think more, uh, more research into the extent to which the direction of innovation may be biased by the uh, by incumbency and by large firms that perpetuate over years would help us to get better insight into what kind of merger and acquisition uh, regime should apply to large digital platforms. Because I think we need to be very careful 
before we simply say any nascent co you know competitor uh, shouldn't be acquired or uh, any firm that could grow into uh, a competitor um, uh, should be acquired. And, and, and this is actually a good point for me to make a disclosure. Um, these are obviously um, uh, live and active debates that relate to certain digital platforms. Um, I provide legal advice to one of these digital platforms, Facebook, for which these are very important uh, issues. So uh, you may want to contextualize my remarks accordingly, but I did want you to have that disclosure as I go forward. But the question that I think uh, one really needs to ask is this. If we have too strict a regime against acquiring nascent competitors or nascent firms, do we disincentivize R&D entry and innovation because there's less of an exit path? And to the extent that the uh, large platforms are effectively a big demander of innovation and uh, new technology, they are a big incentivizer of innovation. That doesn't fully answer the question. We need to know whether that innovation becomes biased towards the things they want to acquire, as opposed to the things that might be optimal for society or best for consumers. But the research I would like to see is the extent to which a stricter merger regime uh, would disincentivize innovation and research on the extent to which there is actually a divergence between the kind of innovation that is occurring and the kind of uh, innovation that might be optimal from a consumer standpoint. I don't think we know the answer to those questions, uh, but I think it would be very helpful to move beyond anecdotes and descriptive statistics and try to understand better how innovation works when there is um, a well understood large demand for certain kinds of innovation and what the impacts of a stricter merger regime might be on both the amount and direction of, inf of innovation coming into the marketplace. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Howard, and to all three speakers for a fantastic presentation. Uh, we do invite the audience to submit questions. As there are none in the queue, I will take the prerogative of the person in the chair uh, to ask uh, a question of the panelists. Um, one of the things that strikes me is the tendency in the debate to lump together a lot of firm, uh, big tech firms together, uh, often under the name GAFA, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, sometimes Fang dropping Apple for Netflix, or uh, in the use of the house, house report dominant platforms or sometimes hypergiants. And in the process then propose solutions that span all of them. And what's striking to me, and I said in a recent op-ed I said, wrote, the idea, Howard points out network effects, switching costs, all of which are real issues, but the idea that those would be the same for search, e-commerce, you know, social networking and the like, the online media distribution and the like would be a, different. And there's a nice piece by Herb Huffington, even within one of the firms, uh, Elizabeth Warren complained about self-preferencing by Amazon and used as her target batteries. And he pointed out actually, Having a private label competing against branded batteries is probably one of the worst examples you could think from a consumer welfare standpoint, because that's an example where the price cost margins are the highest. So I find myself pondering how to intervene here. Uh, I understand Howard and some of the discussions away from moving away from case by case, but on the other hand, the specifics of each firm are so different. And even within firms, we have markets that are very different. I'm trying to figure out how this analysis would work from uh, more from an enforcement perspective, from an uh, academic perspective, how do we think about research in this field in ways that would be helpful? So, just a couple of quick remarks on that, Christopher. I think it's I think it's a great question, and uh, yes, there is huge heterogeneity amongst these platforms that are usually lumped together, and indeed, the regulatory solutions are, are quite distinct. Um, the the sort of glass steagall for the internet. The, the, you know, it gets exactly to the Herb Hovenkamp critique of, of, of Warren's battery example. Um, my own view is that all of these regulatory solutions should solve a problem that antitrust doesn't and should be consistent with the competition promoting objectives of antitrust. I don't like line of business restrictions, which is what Glass-Steagall for the internet separability, you know, of functions is because what that means is Amazon can't enter batteries and sell them in competition with those who are using the platform to sell their batteries. That to me is, 
something you want to engage in as, as a restriction only as a last resort, because what you're doing there is preventing competition. And I think one of the key uh, lessons of the AT&T consent decree is that the line of business restrictions were never terribly workable and almost immediately outliving their utility because that wasn't a clean structural divestiture. Judge Harold Green ruled on over 900 waiver petitions um, to the line of business restrictions. So I don't like those. What I'm thinking about is this and what is common among the platforms is that there are areas in which there are network effects. Now, one can debate the extent to which there is, in fact, a network barrier to entry in an environment where data is plentiful, as Catherine Tucker has written, and and others, and where consumers are used to, not just able to, but used to um, putting a cluster of icons to recreate any set of services they want on, on on their digital devices. And they're very handy at doing that with a click. But there may still be certain what one might call network barriers to entry or data barriers to entry um, that accrue to the very large size. And that could be common across um, large digital platforms. And so I think the research that we want to look into is, is there a way to describe access, interoperability, interconnection uh, in a way that you could have a sufficiently common obligation and monitorable obligation across those apps? Or is there a way of describing the apps generically enough, the services, the platforms, such that you have different rules that apply to different categories of platforms, but that again would be um, easily monitorable, sort of lightweight access rules that overcome either a network or a data barrier to entry? Uh, Chris, you're mute, muted, but I think there's a question from Shannon Coney. Sorry, before I get Maureen, Leon, if there's anything you want to say, I'll give you the opportunity. Um, no, I mean, I, I think, you know, Howard is definitely raises some good uh, theoretical questions. I think the difficulty is in, you know, actually making something that could be so precisely targeted. Uh, that would work better than the market works, <laughs> right? Or the market currently works, um, because I, I think that the, you know all of these little decisions and uh, and uh, you know well we don't want to have you know price effects. We don't you know we don't want to have price regulation and, th- and things like that. And we, you know you kind of think about um, you know can super well uh, crafted regulation do a good job yeah probably but how likely is it that we could create that kind of regulatory model um i think is is the challenge because we have seen you know when you think about some of the areas like where there has been heavy kind of regulation and i don't think howard is saying he wants heavy regulation but they've actually created markets that are very undynamic they're markets that are very like when you think about you know, uh, innovation in some of these markets, I, I think the regulation uh, was very much a drag on, on that occurring. And, and I'm not saying that Howard wants bad regulation, but just as a practical matter, you know, the ability to, uh, to do better in regulation than an impar- admittedly imperfect market does. I think those are the, two, the kind of the two realities you need to compare. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, the, the challenge here is to, to find areas where there are no countervailing benefits and, uh, you know, where there's no ambiguous trade-off, uh, for example, as far as consumer surplus is concerned. Um, and, you know, there, there may not be that many such areas remaining, but if there are such areas, then maybe uh, regulation should be targeted there, if, if at all, it, um, you know, if the issue is not resolved by the market on its own, for instance. But in cases where there are countervailing uh, benefits, I think regulation is, is, is a hard thing to do. Um, so I, I, you know, I tend to agree with, with the other panelists. Well, and it's interesting to me, there's another dimension beyond the pure economics, which is the institutional questions, which is even if it's regulation, is it coming from a, a, uh, from a legislature? Is it coming from an agency? How it's enforced? And uh, we now know that, or courts in the traditional antitrust process, 
all have different institutional strengths, weaknesses, speed of change. All of this is, I think, as Howard points out, a very fertile grounds for further research uh, in terms of extending how to apply. Uh, the question from the chat, which will probably be our last one, is uh, uh, from regarding uh, uh, Maureen's remarks on anecdata. Quality adjusted price in digital markets uh, is obscured by consumer side, consumer side practices with competitive implications. For example, bundling all sorts of small services and benefits together, his example is Amazon Prime, which is obviously video distribution having nothing to do with their core businesses. What can we do better to evaluate consumer welfare in these markets when determining quality adjusted price becomes so complex? We know vertical integration and diversification is rampant here. That's often a good thing, but it makes the research problem much more complicated to isolate what these are. How do, how, what are our tools? How do we do this? Well, I, I might actually redirect that question to uh, Leah or Howard, who are, who are economists. Um, one thing that I would say is that um, we certainly need to understand the benefits, right? And how the, the value of, like over time, we do see complex systems continue to grow. So you think about, uh, Leah was talking about the smartphone, right? So the smartphone, all the value that was brought by the smartphone was from the accumulation of all these different capabilities into a single, a single, I mean, you can, you can add to it, right? Not everyone's smartphone is, is the same. Um, th there's, there's a really good video um, that I encourage people to see, which looks at, it's, it's, it takes a desk, like a, like a physical desk from the, I think probably from the eighties and and then has um, just a laptop and shows all the capabilities that end up being added to, to, to the laptop. Uh, and I don't think we would say that that is a, bad, uh, is a bad thing. But as for actually teasing out the value, I would turn that over to the, <laughs> to the economists on how you know, one might do it. It sounds like Leah has been doing something similar to that. Yeah, I, so I actually wrote a paper on it with, uh, former FTC uh, Economics Bureau Director, Ginger Jin. Um, it's called Big Data at the, at the Crossroads of uh, Consumer Protection and Antitrust. I think it gets at, at some aspects of this question. Uh, the answer is that there are economic mo models that can, can step in and, and be used for this. It's not easy. Uh, even the theory of it is not easy. Uh, there are theoretical models that, that look at, at uh, certain dimensions of, of this. But you know, it needs to be done. A counterfactual needs to be constructed in order to have a meaningful uh, empirical assessment of uh, you know, uh, the impact of policy or the impact of uh, competitive concerns. And I just want to highly recommend uh, Liad's paper with Ginger. It's really worth reading. Thank you. Well, I think every economist who's done this often is bundled. It's very clear that's a consistent challenge. And so I commend it. It's a, a if you're interested in doing this, I encourage you to read the paper and to submit a proposal to explore these topics and others into the grant process, which we have, which goes through October 30th. Uh, we thank, we'd like to thank all of you for joining us and, and particularly thank uh, Maureen, uh, Leon, and Howard for uh, giving us a fantastic launch for this. Uh, as we mentioned, uh, we're also uh, seeking a fellow to support the program. And if you're interested, uh, we do have a website available, which is at law.upenn.edu slash digital economics, uh, where we're posting information and we'll continue to post information about this initiative as it proceeds. Uh, Rakesh, did you want to say anything in closing? Thank you all very much for your time. And we look forward to seeing you at future events and uh, I hope you'll continue to follow us as this research and initiative continues to unfold. <laughs>